all, I wanted to say what a tremendous honor it is to be able to speak to so many people uh, today. As many of you know, tomorrow we'll be holding a key opinion leader event to talk about REACH, uh, Fulcrum's phase three trial in FSHD. Uh, but it seemed absolutely perfect to be able to talk about it first here with this community, uh, who's been such a part of the journey with our company uh, since its inception. Uh, when I, I looked and heard how many participants were, were here today, uh, it was a bit overwhelming, and it just makes us, me personally, and I know the whole team, um, just so happy, pleased, and, and sort of humbled to think that you're taking time out of your day uh, to, to hear this story, to learn more about REACH, and to hopefully, um, to hopefully get involved. Involved. I'm not going to take too much time today uh, on, on intros, but if we want to go to the next slide, uh, what we'll be doing today is, is talking just a little bit about um, a little bit about Fulcrum itself. Uh, Fulcrum is a, a small company located in Cambridge, Massachusetts. It was founded about six years ago, and um, I, I say that because of the uh, the huge amount of progress a small company has made in that time. I've only joined it a year ago as president of R&D. It's such an exciting opportunity to, to come into a company that has a, a fantastic discovery engine, clinical stage assets, and probably most importantly for me, a group of dedicated scientists and drug developers uh, that have really baked in uh, patient focus and unmet medical need at the core of, of what we do here. So we'll, I'll take a look at the next slide, which is, is just a brief overview of, of the company. Where do we focus? We are specifically focused as a company on addressing unmet medical need in genetically defined rare disorders. So we have a proprietary discovery engine, Fulcrum Seek, and I feel it's truly differentiated in the industry in terms of the speed and scale at which we identify targets that can, um, that can address these, these unmet medical needs and rare disease. Currently, we have three clinical stage programs, uh, one in sickle cell disease, another that we're starting in non-sickle -non hemoglobinopathies. Uh, we have another drug coming up that, that we'll be announcing early in 2023, but probably most importantly for today is to talk about our lead candidate, uh, Losmapamod, which many of you know, uh, we are starting phase three, the REACH trial, and we believe we're positioned to be first to market with a therapy that will slow the progression of FSHD. So before we sort of turn it over to some more content about that, I just wanted to take a minute and introduce the team members here. Um, the, the team has grown considerably over the past four or five, six years. I've been here a year and I think I'm the second longest uh, you know, employed person at Fulcrum on this call. So really taking the chance to, um, to sort of show you the team that's growing along with the progress in FSHD and we're adding expertise all of the time to really keep up with the pace of development um, that we want to maintain and that this community deserves. So with us today on the call, you'll hear from Jen McNary, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to um, entice Jen to come into Fulcrum and work with a patient advocacy um, from, from inside of a company. And I know that many of you know Jen and uh, will continue to work with her in uh, the, the REACH trial and, and beyond. Also with us today is, is another Jen, Jennifer Webster, who is the program lead for our program in, for the Los Mapamod Molecule. So anything less Mapamod goes through Jennifer. And as we add expertise, different functions, regulatory responsibilities, clinical responsibilities, drug supply responsibilities, uh, we have a growing team and, and Jennifer leads that team. With us also today is Olga Middleman, who is Senior Vice President and Head of Medical Affairs for our group. So as we go out into the world, we uh, present science at more and more meetings, uh, Olga really is going to help lead our messaging uh, to the various stakeholders in FSD, FSHD, patients, scientists, regulators. And finally, someone many of you may well know is Jenny Shosky, who is really leading the clinical charge on this program. Jenny is responsible for clinical trial execution and strategy. Uh, she worked on the last program, REACH, and she will also be leading clinical efforts here on uh, the last program, Redux4, and now is leading uh, efforts on the REACH trial. So all of us are fairly new, but who the person I'll introduce next is Anthony Corsi. And Anthony has been with this molecule and with Fulcrum since the inception. 
And I'm, I'm pleased to uh, introduce you to Anthony because when I met him, he really embodies exactly what we want to be at Fulcrum. And that is a group of scientists and drug developers who think critically about the science through the lens of unmet need and patient focus. So we've asked Anthony to come and talk to you a bit about the early biology, since he was a part of the team that brought this biology forward. So Anthony, with that, I'll hand it to you. Thanks, Judy, appreciate it. <clears throat> it's, a, it's really a great honor to be here today and, and speak with all of you to give a little bit of an overview of the, the work that's gone into the Los Mapamod program and, and really the journey that we've taken alongside you all uh, over the last five plus years and something that I've had the, the great privilege of, of being part of since, since the early inception. So like many great journeys, it started with an idea and the idea that we had was to identify small molecules that would reduce the expression uh, of duct spore, which we know is the, the root cause of FSHD. Uh, through those efforts, we were able to identify a protein called P38 alpha beta MAP kinase that is a regulator of duct spore expression uh, in uh, patient cells that were uh, derived from muscles from FSHD patients. Uh, and such that inhibition of P38 reduces duct spore expression in those cells. And so from there, we worked to then bring forward a, a molecule that we could bring into the clinic and start uh, working through there and translate the insights that we uh, derive from our preclinical work now into clinical work. Uh, we wanted a molecule that uh, was able to one, reduce duct spore in patient cells uh, in the dish, two, that we could achieve concentrations uh, that would translate into what we would believe to be uh, potentially clinically efficacious doses based on those preclinical models. Uh, and three, of course, uh, was safe. Uh, and as you can see on the slide, and as you might have guessed, Los Mapamod fit the bill uh, for, for all of that criteria. And then we worked to, to bring that forward to try to solve the problem of FSHD. Next slide, Jenny. And our understanding of FSHD, of course, in, in some small extent, comes from uh, what we've learned uh, in, in our ability to read the literature. But really, our understanding of FSHD comes from our partnership with the patient community and, and from all of you. Um, and that partnership dates back all the way to the early days of Fulcrum when we were just getting our lab set up, uh, when we were meeting with, with you all in the atrium of our um, of our first office that looked very much like a prototypical startup, very fuzzy colors and a lot of goofy things on the walls. Um, that built and continued partnership through our second office that looked a little bit more fancy. Um, there we were able to do lab tours and continue those discussions and partnerships. And that continued on all the way through uh, the last couple of years where we moved them into Zoom. Uh, and it was through that partnership that we were able to really get a a better understanding about what FSHD means. And I think one of the things that came across really quickly was that uh, FSHD is not a slowly progressive disease that is typically characterized. Uh, it might be variably progressive, but we've, we've learned that that's not the case. It is truly uh, a disease of, of cumulative burden uh, and burden not only on um, those living with FSHDs, but their caregivers and their family alike. Uh, and it was through that understanding that we were able to, to really start to tailor our clinical development uh, program towards um, the specific manifestations of FSHD. Um, so for example, some of the things that we were able to, to really learn um, from this community was, you know, things along the lines of social interactions and some of the challenges with conveying uh, emotion because of the facial weakness. Um, something along the lines of we've understood from you is uh, things like going out to eat uh, can be a multiple hour planning affair because of some of the challenges with mobility. Things like brushing your hair and, and brushing your teeth can be a challenge in and of itself. And these are the things that really helped to inform us and, and really helped us to build our clinical development program that was really tailored towards FSHD specificity, but really most importantly, uh, in a way that was going to serve you because ultimately that is what we are here to do. And so on the next slide, you can see a snapshot uh, of the, the Los Mapamide program uh, over the years and the various different clinical studies um, that informed uh, where we are today and really drove to, to where we are today. Um, that began in our clinical, stu our preparatory studies where we worked to refine endpoints, everything from uh, molecular biomarkers all the way up through 
novel clinical endpoints. Next was phase one, where we confirmed um, that los mapamod was uh, safe in patients living with FSHD. Um, but also importantly, we confirmed that uh, the dose that we plan to move forward with, uh, we were able to achieve drug concentrations and what we call target engagement uh, to levels that we believed would be sufficient to drive um, some clinical benefit. Next, we had our phase two, which we had the, the, the great pleasure of being able to, to share with you all last June uh, at the FSHD Society's International Research Conference, and we'll go through those uh, in the next slide uh, in a second. Um, that study is still ongoing uh, in an open label extension. And we also have a, a phase two open label study that's currently an open label extension as well um, in the Netherlands. I wanna just pause on, on this slide for a second because it's a, it's a moment worth noting because as you can see, there was a lot of work uh, that has been put into the Los Mapamai program. And by a lot of work, I don't mean by the people at Fulcrum per se, I mean by all of you uh, in the patient community. These, this was a, a large amount of work in, in effort that we asked of all of you to, to join with us on this journey. Everything from muscle biopsies through the pandemic uh, and your commitment never wavered. Um, and I think it is that commitment to the research, to the community and to each other um, that allowed us to have the ability to discuss the exciting phase two results last June and really importantly allow us to be here today to talk about the first phase three uh, ever run in FSHD. Uh, and, and just to take a moment, I think, you know, we would not be here today if it wasn't for all of that commitment. And so going back to the phase two, uh, and some of the learnings that we built uh, on that phase two uh, in the next slide, um, it really started with um, uh, uh, the ability for us to understand some of the structural changes that happen um, in muscle that are the driving forces of, of loss of function uh, in this case, which is the replacement of contractile muscle tissue uh, to uh, non-contractile fat tissue. And we saw a reduction in that, that fatty infiltration by MRI analyses. We also saw that those structural changes uh, uh, translated into improvements in function, specifically uh, in the shoulder, as we measured with uh, reachable workspace. And, and lastly, we heard from you that you were that the, the patients in that trial actually uh, reported feeling better, that those changes that we saw on structural and functional benefits were actually translating into patients feeling better. Uh, and lastly, of course, and very importantly, is that Los Mapamod was shown to be, again, safe and tolerable over that 48-week study uh, in patients living uh, with FSHD. And so this is only a really small snapshot summary of all the learnings that we derived uh, from that phase two study. Uh, the next logical question is, well, Anthony, learnings are great, but what are you going to do with those? Uh, and so for that, I'm going to pass it on to Judy, who's going to discuss uh, how these vast learnings we derived from this phase two went on to inform the phase three. Judy? Perfect. Thank you, Anthony. So as Anthony said, we learned a lot from the phase two trial. Um, and in addition to this data, we continue to talk to you. We continue to attend meetings to learn about what matters. How do we deliver something in an oral therapy that, that truly matters to patients? We talk to key opinion leaders as well. And we also talk to regulators. And what's interesting about being first is it truly is a collaboration as you work to, to help um, regulators around the world understand not only the disease, but build a path forward. And the first thing that every regulator states is what's important to the patient. And we feel based on our, our, our work with this community uh, that we were well prepared to answer that. And what we saw in phase two was we measured what mattered. What did we learn? We learned a few things that were important for us, but for the research community at large. And that is how long does a study have to be to be able to see disease progression and potential drug effect? As you know, the Redux4 study was 48 weeks long. That was long enough. And we will, in the REACH study, also have a 48 week duration. Function is important. How do patients feel and function? Reachable workspace is, is an endpoint that's been around for a while in terms of measuring upper extremity function. No one has used it as a primary efficacy variable in a registration trial. We are going to utilize that in the REACH trial. And it, what that does is, if you don't know about it, is it really measures how much relative surface area people can access with their upper arms. 
So as Anthony alluded to, if you can't raise your arms over your head, self-grooming, washing your hair, raising a hairbrush to, to uh, comb your hair is, is an issue. If you can't reach behind you, cell phone in your pocket, um, reaching your wallet out of your back pocket. Reachable workspace has proven to be sensitive to change, highly reliable, and something that people can relate to. It really is intuitive. And so we're very happy that, that um, regulators have acknowledged its utility as a functional endpoint, and we will be the first to take it into a registration trial. In terms of disease pathology, as muscle dies and fat infiltrates muscle, we did show in the Redux4 trial that Los Mapamod stops that fat infiltration. So we will use MFI or muscle fat infiltration in our trial as a secondary endpoint. And then probably most importantly, if we maintain muscle health and we maintain function, is that benefit that we're delivering meaningful to patients? And so we will have a patient reported outcome, the patient global impression of change, as well as the neuroqual, which is a measure that's been around for a long time, that's highly sensitive and that is qualitative. So we put these together, 48 week trial with a highly sensitive functional endpoint that the patient community has recognized as valuable and that the regulators have accepted as a functional endpoint. Looking at muscle health, and then finally, how does it all come together? to impact patients. So on the next slide is, is a diagram outlining how we're putting this together in the first phase three trial for FSHD, really looking to demonstrate that Los Mapamod can slow or stop disease progression. So this will be a 48 week trial. Uh, we will enroll about 230 subjects with FSHD one and FSHD two. Volunteers in the trial will be 18 to 65 years old and we're running this trial globally. I talked about the primary endpoints, the secondary endpoints, and we'll also act, um, be asking questions about healthcare utilization. Overall, are patients requiring less assistance because of the presence of drug? Uh, how does this impact how, how patients are living and taking care of, of their health? So with that, I think, do we have another slide? That, that may be the last slide but I think it's time to probably open it up to, um, to this community uh, for questions and discussions about Los Mapamod uh, specifically and the REACH trial. Thanks, Judy. Yes, so I've already got a list of, of questions that have been sent over. And just as a reminder, um, we are not monitoring the chat function. We are monitoring the question and answer function. So I would be happy to take your questions if you wanna send one over. And of course, there are only so many questions that we actually can answer at this time. There are still more pieces of information that we will be able to share at a later date. So if I don't ask your question, it's because we don't have an answer. Feel free to follow up with me so that I can save it and get back to you when we do know the answer to that question. The first one is a pretty easy one, so I'm just going to go ahead and answer it. Um, and the question is, uh, will we be going over how to sign up for the clinical trial? So the trial is not open for recruitment quite yet. Um, when it is, it will be on clinicaltrials.gov, and that will show you where you can go to, to reach out and say that you are interested. But for now, if you kind of want to get a head start on being notified when there is more information, you can check that email address um, at the bottom of the slide that's up right now. Um, and just send, send an email to let folks know that you are interested in learning when there is more information about re being recruited for a clinical trial. And Sandra, my colleague, will get back to you. The next question that I have here, and they're rolling in like crazy now, we have 41 of them. Um, so I'm just gonna go down the list. Um, so this one is a very, first a kind statement. Thank you to everybody involved um, and you are very welcome. This is very meaningful for us as well. Um, and the question is around inclusion and exclusion criteria for the study, um, whether there's an age cutoff or a condition cutoff, meaning severity. And so I'm hoping that Judy from my team is able to answer that one. Sure, I'll start and then uh, the rest of the team can certainly chime in. You know, the interesting thing about clinical research is it's a balance, right? We have to balance really studying the broadest group of people that, that we can to really understand the utility of the drug while simultaneously having it be homogenous enough that we don't have too much variability. 
were able to conduct the trial in a reasonable amount of time. And so we've really tried to do our best to um, make the trial as inclusive as possible, but also be able to execute it in a way that will show those statistical and clinically meaningful differences in the, the, the shortest amount of time possible. So the inclusion exclusion criteria for this trial are almost identical to the Redux 4 trial. And that's because we had such success with the Redux 4 trial. With only 40 patients in each group, we were able to show a difference in fat infiltration. We were able to show a difference in function. You were able to tell us that you recognize the benefit of drug. The only slight tweak we're going to make is to put some limitations in terms of the reachable workspace scale. And let me just take a moment to explain that and explain why. We essentially put a ceiling and a floor on it, right? Because in this trial, we're looking for patients who will progress, but also whom will be able to see that, that stopping of progression. So if you have a very high reachable workspace scale and are functioning very well, chances are in the 48 weeks, you'll progress less than somebody who has a lower scale, lower score. So we are having an upper limit on that of a, a score of 0.7. And then at the other end of the spectrum, if there's already very little function and you have a score of 0.2, um, it's unlikely that you will progress more or where the scale isn't sensitive enough to pick up that progression. So we will limit the lower level. So the, the trial is, as I say, balanced to be as inclusive as possible, um, including this time both uh, subjects who have FSHD1 and or FSHD2. Uh, and the only change we're really making in terms of that cutoff is the cutoff for reachable workspace. And the rationale for that, as I explained, is to really have the most sensitive trial. I don't know, Jenny, if you want to add anything else or any of the other of the other panelists. Yeah, I think those are the, the, the main features. I, I will say that once um, the study is registered, it will be on clinicaltrials.gov with the full inclusion and exclusion criteria. Thanks, Jenny, and thanks, Judy. And I'm going to move right along just because I'm going to try to get to as many of these now 60 questions as possible. So I'm going to wrap the next two questions into one because it talks about what we saw in phase two. Um, the first question is, has, was there an increase in muscle mass seen? And the second one was um, around improvement in function. Um, and was that a limited improvement or is it still ongoing? Are we still seeing improvements? And I'm going to send that to start with Judy. And then Judy, I'm going to ask you to, to send it to the appropriate person next. Sure. And then maybe, maybe we can break, break it up a little bit, I guess. Um, so one question was, was there an increase in muscle mass? And, you know, we're not looking for improvement with this drug. It is not regenerative. We're really looking for it to stop progression. And so what we looked for was, is muscle fat increasing in people who were receiving placebo? And it was. Was it increasing in patients or people who, who were on Los Mapamod? There was no increase in muscle fat, and that was the end point. So we weren't really focused on looking at an increase in muscle tissue in general. We were really focused on, do we stop fat infiltration? And then there was a second part of that question, was it on, oh, it was on function. So as, as you know, and we, we've talked about earlier, Anthony described the fact that we have uh, the open label extension study ongoing from Redux 4. Um, the vast majority were over 99% uh, people in that trial who remain in that trial. And now we're getting to, we're just past the 96 week time point. So there's an opportunity to again say, thank you to be able to um, retain this number of people who are so committed to the research and are staying in this trial um, during COVID, uh, continuing to um, help us to collect this data. Um, it's overwhelming for us to have this level of commitment. Uh, we continue to look at that data and we have no evidence. Um, you know, we have not yet, um, we have not yet released that data publicly. Uh, we will find the right time and place to, to share that data, probably with many of you, as we did with Redux 4. Uh, but we are confident that um, there will be a, a robust and maintained effect, and that is really the goal of the therapy. And that's why um, the duration of this trial, 48 weeks, is a meaningful amount of time to be able to follow once patients have improved, or not improved, but once disease progression has stopped, 
to be able to follow that for a meaningful, um, meaningful time period to ensure there is that maintenance of effect. So more to come on that data as we continue to analyze it, but uh, we are very hopeful. And from what we understand about the biology, very uh, cautiously optimistic, of course, that, that we will be able to maintain uh, that robust effect. Thanks, Judy. I'm going to, I'm seeing a few questions about safety and side effects. So um, what was the, uh, the, the safety profile and, and what are the side effects that we're seeing? Jenny, do you want to take this one? Or just getting off mute, but um, as Anthony mentioned before, um, this medication was in license from another company. So we actually have safety experience and in over 3,500 um, healthy volunteers or patients uh, in the past. And then we've dosed an additional about 100 patients with FSHD or healthy volunteers. Um, and what we've seen is consistency across all of those studies. Um, and, and the most common side effects are things like headache or um, minor uh, things like nausea. Um, they will be shared as we um, have done in the past, but we haven't had any serious um, related adverse events in our last study. Thanks, Jenny. And we yeah, are seeing... Oh, go ahead, Judy. Oh, I was just going to say that um, we have over 100 uh, patients with FSHD now being uh, exposed for over two years. So um, the, the safety profile really, um, that kind of uh, people sticking with it really does speak to that tolerability as well. And I think, I think that's important to note that um, it is um, the experience with the drug has not led to discontinuations because of safety or tolerability issues. And we are seeing a number of questions also about trial site locations. And I know that we can't answer that specifically, but Jenny, if you want to tackle that one around uh, trial site locations and how folks can find out more um, as time goes by. Yeah, absolutely. So you can see on this slide that our target locations right now are in the US, Canada, UK, and Europe. We're currently undergoing the process of feasibility to really finalize our site list, and those will be posted on clinicaltrials.gov, and they'll be communicated with the FSHD Society as well. Um, and, and we will also update through our patient inquiry email that's listed on this slide. Thanks, Jenny. And then we also have a question uh, around um, eligibility uh, in terms of uh, functionality. So it, what is the inclusion criteria based on current function and how affected do you need to be and how affected is too affected? I'm not sure who wants to take that one, but I'm seeing it in a number of different ways. Yeah. So I think we, we talked about that already to a large degree and really because the um, the upper extremity function is the primary endpoint. We have put that ceiling and that floor on upper extremity function of a 0.7 to a, a 0.2. And so people with a great degree of function who are unlikely to progress during the 48 weeks would be excluded simply because we wouldn't be able to measure change. Um, similarly, people at the lower end of that scale um, who may not, we not may be able to um, measure uh, more progression uh, would be excluded as well. And that would be the only change that we'd be making in terms of inclusion exclusion from the Redux 4 trial. Um, the idea is that that trial um, showed such great results, both from a statistical and clinical perspective, um, that, that it is best to sort of do that trial again as a demonstration, uh, but really tighten up those criteria just a little bit so that we can um, look, at, at the, uh, look at the efficacy signal uh, in, in the most careful way possible. And I'll just add one, one more thing to that, Judy, is that in this study, unlike Redux4, we do not have muscle biopsy. So any inclusion criteria related to that in any of the screening procedures or other procedures will not be in place for the phase three study. So we really appreciate, and we know that this, that was a burdensome assessment. We were able to learn a lot from it from the phase two, but it will not be a part of the phase three study. That's a really great point. It makes the it makes the study much more patient friendly if if there's no uh, invasive biopsy. It's a great point. I'm getting a great question about genetic testing, and I know this is near and dear to everybody's heart. What if 
a patient is just generationally affected by FSHD and wants to consider participating in a, in a clinical trial, what might be their, their best option going forward? I can answer that one. Yeah, sure. So um, we uh, will require, as we did in our last trial, um, that there is genetic testing confirming a diagnosis. Um, we will allow if there's a, a family history of diagnosis that you can start some of the screening procedures while you get giant genetically tested. We will be providing genetic testing for FSHD1 or FSHD2. Um, so we do want to make sure that patients are genetically confirmed and tested at a CLIA certified lab, which we will be taking care of, um, but we will require genetic testing for enrollment into the study. Thanks, Jenny. There's another question around um, following the placebo part of the trial. Is there a planned open label follow-up for those who were on placebo? Jennifer Webster, do you want to take that? I think they're, everyone may be a little bit tired of my voice and Jennifer, yeah. Jenny's voice. So let's go to the I, other Jennifer. We need, we need all the Jennies to speak, so I'm happy to jump in there. But I did notice Jam Schmidt had come off um, mute, and I wanted to offer him the opportunity to, to maybe comment on the prior question first. Thank you so much. Um, yes, actually, uh, with regards to genetic testing, the FSHD Society, uh, with the support of Fulcrum and other um, industry um, partners are going to be launching a genetic testing initiative for patients so they can actually have confirmed genetic testing uh, and be able to enroll in upcoming clinical trials. Um, we will be probably running the next uh, FSHD University webinar uh, to explain that program. Right now we're beta testing it, but we're looking to launch that uh, in mid-April. Thank you very much. Yeah, that's a fantastic initiative. So thank you for, for highlighting that here. And to the question on an open label extension trial, um, as Anthony mentioned, in our prior work, we did allow for patients who had enrolled in the primary study to continue participating in our program via the open label extension. And the reason for that is because we do understand in the context of a randomized trial where it's just as likely um, a participant will receive placebo as it is likely that they would receive an active treatment. We believe in fairness to the patients participating, the open label extension offers an opportunity for all patients to receive treatment within the context of a trial. We do also value the data that is generated out of those programs to help us understand the longitudinal effect and the benefit that you may be seeing as patients um, when this, in the presence of this drug being administered. Hopefully that helps. And um, we look forward to talking more about that open label extension as the primary study rolls on. So I'm definitely seeing some questions about the, the over age 65. Um, some of the questions are around why not include over age 65, but also some questions uh, about whether we're surmising that this treatment would not benefit those over age 65 and whether it would be possible once the drug is approved for folks over age 65 to have access uh, through commercialization. So I'm hoping that we can try to answer those questions. Yes, that, that's very straightforward, and, and I can take that question. Um, in the course of drug development, when you're bringing something forward, um, what we do is we, we start with a, a narrower age range, and then we continue to generate data to learn things about the drug, and then we broaden the criteria for eligibility. So currently, what we, will, we, what we are doing is understanding how people over the age of 65 metabolize this drug. How does their body break it down? Is, the same, is a dose in a 25-year-old the same as a dose in a 65-year-old? Those studies are some planned and some ongoing. And the hope is that once we get this trial done, at that point, we will have enough safety and exposure information in other populations like the elderly to be able to have a broader label. So really in terms of the elderly, it's nothing specific about losmapamod. This is really just drug development in terms of, of starting with a narrow population and then answering a number of questions to gradually increase, increase, increase uh, the patients for whom this is appropriate. So we're working very hard to sort of balance getting the REACH trial off the ground, but also those pharmacology studies uh, to enable us at the time of registration to have a broader label. Thanks, Judy. 
And I'm seeing a question that I think is very common for those that are interested in clinical trials during a pandemic. Um, so some folks are saying they haven't been to a doctor or they haven't been able to receive care for quite some time due to COVID. And how can they best prepare um, to, to screen for a clinical trial? What should their next steps be, um, whether it's for, uh, for treatment or for, um, for reaching out for the study? So maybe I'll jump in on that and then I'd love to hear from the study as well. Um, I think, um, well, actually, I'm going to pause there. And Jamshit, did you want to jump on and offer some context from the society as well? I don't want to uh, supersede your comments. No? Okay. Maybe this is one of the challenges of speaking live. So, Jenny, can you, or Jen, can you just reorientate us again to the primary part of the question? Yeah, I think that the point is that some for folks that haven't been receiving regular care, is there anything yeah. special that they need to do to be ready for a clinical trial? Thank you. My head was wandering a bit there. So I think um, the first thing always is to talk to your physician and your care team, right? They are the folks that are navigating this journey with you most primarily, and they will have insight and information to help you digest some of what we're sharing with you here and other information that's available to them as well. I think we're all trying to figure out how to crawl back out of the COVID, um, the, the COVID early days. And I think coming back out into the world is important and meaningful, but first and foremost, we want everyone to feel safe and comfortable. So by all means, you know, follow your own gut as to what makes sense for you and your family and your, your broader ecosystem of care and, and lean in on your professionals that are helping you through that journey. We've mentioned here the, the trial um, email that has specifics around our trial and participating, um, but that's a really a much broader question in terms of how you engage within your medical system. And hopefully included in that can be conversations around clinical trials, um, but only in the context of, of where you're comfortable and feeling safe. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, there are some questions around whether other medications that patients may be taking um, would prohibit them from entering our phase three study. So this is another question very much like the age limit question. So as we continue to study the drug, we run a number of studies to be able to rule in or rule out interactions between various medications. So there will be a list of allowed medications. And as we add more data and understand more about interactions with them, we'll continue to broaden the concomitant medications that, that, that patients will be able to take along with lismapamod. So at this point in development, uh, we do have data on a number of medications or um, the way that medications are metabolized, but we continue to do that work and continue to, to educate and to amend the trial as we get more data that would be more, allow us to be more inclusive. Thanks, Judy. And the same question for scapular surgery. I'm assuming it's the same answer, but since I see it several times, um, does scapular surgery previously make it um, make a patient unable to participate in a phase three? Jennifer uh, Shasky, I'll, I'll ask you that one with the inclusion exclusion. Yes, so as, as part of our exclusion is any um, relevant surgeries or medical history that may impact the, the study itself. I think scapular surgery is something that um, we did have patients from our last trial that had um, this surgery in their past, and it wasn't a, a great uh, part of the study. So it's something we'll be looking at on a case-by-case -case basis um, that may or may not uh, rule in a patient or out a patient. Thanks, Jenny. So, so the answer there is really see one of the trial screening sites if you've had a surgical intervention, and they will make a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, another question around these 230 patients, will these be new patients or would these be counting the folks that are already in the open label? New, so this will be 230 additional people living with FSHD1 or FSHD2 that will be um, participating in the trial, exposed to less mapamod and really growing that safety database and patient experience. Thanks, Judy. We have a question about children. Um, so is it anticipated that either there will be a study that will include a pediatric population or that after commercialization, children, um, teenagers and children will be able to get access to Lismapamod? 
Sure. Um, and I sound a little bit like a broken record. And, um, and Olga, I'll also maybe ask you to, to chime in. But this is really the same answer that I've given before. We continue to work to expand, expand, expand. How do children metabolize the drug? What is their exposure? Um, what is the safety in these different age groups in terms of drug exposure and how it's metabolized? So in the course of a development program, of course, we want to continue to expand, expand, expand population. Well, I don't know if you have a, a better answer than that. I keep giving the same answer. So uh, perhaps perhaps you have a better way of putting this. Judy, ju thank you. Just to echo what you said and to reiterate that we have full from really recognize the importance of this population and that we are proactively discussing what our approach should be, including the regulatory implications, which are very important here. Thanks so much, Olga. So there's another question and I think we answered it. So I'm just gonna answer this one, but I just saw it pop up is whether there would be um, a rollover into drug after the placebo arm. And, and the answer to that is yes. But a follow on at, uh, question that we got is, will folks ever be taken off of drug or will the placebo or will the open label extension go all the way until there's an FDA approved drug? Do we know that already? Olga? We do. And so we intend to continue um, the participants in the in this study on drug until it is commercially available. Thanks, Olga. The next question is um, around the uh, whether folks who were excluded via age um, or mobility have access to Los Mathamod before it is approved. So let me let me um, let me answer this question. So I think the implication here is looking at expanded access and where we are in our thinking. And so what we can say today is that we are very much committed to making Las Mapamat available as quickly as possible via the regulatory approval process. And to that end, we very actively encourage participation in the REACH phase three trial. And our goal is to allow access when doing so does not disrupt or slow down the development process. And when we are considering expanded access, that can occur when the following things are in place. We know that there is adequate safety and efficacy data to ensure a positive risk benefit assessment for an individual patient. And when we can be sure that there is enough, supp enough supply of the investigational drug lasmapamod for an EAP program after considerations have been made for all the ongoing trials, including REACH. And when providing expanded access to what is still an investigational treatment will not affect the ongoing clinical development program. And so currently what we're doing is we're gauging interest in EAP. We're taking in and monitoring requests and working very diligently to implement the program as soon as it is feasible and possible. Thank you, Olga. We have a question about the Microsoft Connect and I'm thinking this is gonna to go to Jenny. Um, given that the, and I'm gonna read it directly because I think that's important. So given that Microsoft Connect is being phased out as a hardware component commercially, how are you looking to measure reachable workspace in future studies or in the clinical setting? Yeah, so I can definitely um, answer this. So essentially the, the reachable workspace procedure is um, a procedure where or some essentially a patient is sitting in front of a camera and that's the Microsoft Connect. It can use any other camera, but this is the one that we've used in our past. Um, and as this person mentioned, it is being commercially phased out for our phase three. We still do have access to the Microsoft Connect devices and we still will be utilizing them. Um, they are still available for us and will be used for our uh, phase three trial. We're also working with the reachable workspace group to evaluate other cameras and to, to validate them as it is just the, the camera software and there are multiple other softwares that, that could be used. But great question. That is yeah. a great question. 
it's a, it's a really good question. And, and, you know, the other piece of this is that um, physicians too will, will not have to use reachable workspace in the clinic. So reachable workspace is being used in a research scenario because it is quantitative. It's very sensitive to change. But when we think about a physician, they may, may well use self-report. Um, quality of life questions. Um, are you having trouble dressing yourself? How, how are your activities of daily living going? So it's not anticipated that every physician will have a reachable workspace in their office, nor will that be required. Really, we are using reachable workspace because of its sensitivity and because of, it, because of its uniformity around the world as we run this trial. But physicians will be able to um, understand the benefit to patients by questions and questionnaires about activities of daily living and how are things going in your day-to-day -day life. Thanks, Judy. So we're seeing a lot of timeline questions and some of them dip into regulatory. So I'm gonna put it out there, even though we don't have a regulatory expert on the line, but assuming the best, assuming that we get great results from phase three, what would be the anticipated time frame for an FDA approval and the drug actually being available by prescription? So, I'm sorry, could you repeat like just the, the last part of it or maybe? Yeah, it so, so it's yeah, quick. sure, well, sure. <laughs> Happy to, Judy. So assuming the best, assuming mm -hmm. best case scenario with our study and that we see everything that we want to see in the data, how soon or what's the timeline for an FDA approval and a uh, chance to receive the drug commercially via prescription? Okay, it, it's an important question and really the one that everybody wants the answer to, I think including um, this team. And really what will be very limiting uh, for us and what will really drive this trial is the enrollment. So if we're able to enroll patients um, you know, in a, in a reasonable, at a reasonable pace, we are prepared, um, we are preparing in the background uh, our regulatory documents, our dossiers uh, for regulators around the world. Um, it still takes 48 weeks to run a 48 week trial. So really the, uh, the length of the trial is really going to uh, be dependent on when that last person, uh, when that last person enrolls. And then we have 48 weeks after that and then certainly some time for data preparation, et cetera, all of the other things. So we'll be able to give more information about that. We have not provided any guidance around that. We are really focused on a fast start, opening up sites, selecting sites, getting them ready to, to enroll. And once we get an idea of the enrollment pace, uh, we'll be able to supply more information as we always have in the past uh, in the right forum about the progress of the trial. But um, I think everyone on this call is as interested in the answer to that question as you are. And I think that um, really the, uh, the driving factor of how quickly will this be accomplished is really how quickly the patient community can um, pr be provided access to this trial. And I think if there's one thing I could just add to that, Judy, because I think that that's right, and that is how we think about it, and I will definitely say I am quite interested in the answer to that question as well. Um, but one important thing to note is that as we have evolved our clinical program and our understanding of this potential medicine, we have engaged with regulator, regulatory agencies here in the States and elsewhere. And so while we can never predict nor opine on what their ultimate opinions will be related to this becoming a, a medicine on market, we do know that they are um, aware of our phase three trial design. They understand it was informed by our clinical program prior, and they have bought into reachable workspace as a functional endpoint, representing the structural benefit that we believe is occurring, as well as ultimately how you as patients and people living with FSHD are feeling. So I think that's an important piece to remember as well. Thanks, Jen. There's a process question in the chat around how are patients chosen for this study? How does that work and, and how does it work stepwise? What is the clinical trial process? So maybe I'll start and give a couple of steps and I think everyone will, will chime in. So first and foremost, um, you know, showing up on a webinar like this and learning more about the trial uh, is the first step. Ed, patient education and understanding what a clinical trial is all about is, is first and foremost. Um, this is a very, very um, well-informed group. Our, our uh, interaction with the FSHD Society uh, has been one of really being impressed by, by how well this community understands research. So understanding what 
trial participation is about understanding that um, in a blinded trial, you may not be receiving drug or you may be receiving drug. Um, finding a clinical trial site on clinicaltrials.gov. And then going through the screening, right? Getting to screening is the best way to be involved in the clinical trial because at that point, the screening visit will be an education. It will be an education on the responsibilities of what participation means, the time commitment, um, look at a calendar. What, what does this mean in terms of, of when you'll be expected to, to be at visits, et cetera? We understand more than anyone that participating in a 48 week long trial is a commitment. It is something that, that people are, are willing to do to progress the, the development of important um, medications like this. So the best first step is education, which you're getting today, but that will be continued in a visit to a clinical trial site. And those will be listed on clinicaltrials.gov when it's available. There will be education provided there, screening, looking at all the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, laboratories, genetic testing, reachable workspace testing. When all of that data is looked at, if the patient qualifies, um, they will be uh, contacted and then, then the trial commences. I don't know if, if people on, is there something I, I left out or an important aspect of this that, that maybe somebody else wants to comment on? I think you got it. Yeah, I think you got it. I think just in terms of kind of breaking it down for people who are interested, there will be announcements following the FSHD Society is the best way to hear about that. Then there will be trial sites and reaching out to those contacts at the trial sites to let them know you're interested. And then those trial sites will let you know what the burden of the study is, what the expectations are, and you will be given an opportunity to talk with the physician, with your physician and make the decision. And you'll see all of those visits laid out in front of you. So in terms of, of kind of the next steps here, you haven't missed anything. Trial sites have not yet been announced, but when they are, you'll know about them. So I'm also seeing quite a few questions around whether or not we can guess that the therapeutic, that losmapamod, will have some benefit in the lower body if we're seeing benefit in the upper body via reachable workspace. And I know that's a huge concern, and there's a number of different ways that people ask that question. Um, but the, given that our discussion and our endpoints kind of center around the upper body, can one think that there would be also same benefit in the lower body? Sure. So Anthony, I'm going to start here and then maybe ask you to chime in a little bit about Duck Spore in particular. Um, so as, as this community well knows, um, the root cause of FSHD is this aberrant expression of Duck Spore in skeletal muscle. This occurs throughout the body. Los Mapamod will address this throughout the body, and that's really the work that Anthony and his team did early on to really understand the engagement of Los Mapamod with, with Dux4. We're choosing the upper extremity for a couple of reasons. One, when we talk to patients, uh, whether it's sort of qualitatively or in quantitative surveys, well over 95% of patients with FSHD report that upper extremity function is very, very important. So one, we wanted to address something that was meaningful. Two, we're using the upper extremity as a representative muscle group. So the impact of Los Mapamod will be uniform, but we, we don't need to measure every uh, extremity or, or muscle to, to prove that it works. And again, as this community has told us, uh, muscles are hetero, the, the, the heterogeneity of, of how this disease affects muscles between patients and even within the same patient is vast. So being able to select a single muscle group to be representative and study it with a highly quantitative and very sensitive device, uh, we think is, is appropriate. But Anthony, I don't know if you have any more comment that can help people understand the biology and the fact that just because we're measuring the arm doesn't mean that this is just a drug for upper extremity. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, Judy. I think, of course, there are <clears throat> pragmatic reasons to, to choose an upper extremity function. I think based on what we know about the biology of um, duct spore expression, we have no reason biologically to believe that there would be any difference, for example, between regulation in the upper extremity versus in the lower extremity. Um, we can also say to, to a large extent, the, the MRI analyses that we'll, we will include um, will have information from the lower extremity uh, as well. Um, so, so we will certainly be um, 
collecting information that will speak to some of that um, as, as that trial goes on. But in terms of biology, we believe it all works um, exactly the same to whatever we know in terms of both upper and lower extremity. Thanks, Anthony. There's a question about the distribution of patients. So how many placebo patients versus how many on active drug uh, out of that 230? Jenny? Yeah, so this trial will be randomized one-to-one, -one, which means that half of the patients will be, on, will be randomized to placebo, which is about 115, and half will be randomized to low SMAPAMOD, which will be another 115. And the next question about distribution is how many patients will be accepted at, at each site? Will they be equal um, or will there be some other distribution of patients uh, across countries? So well, I can jump in on that one and then Jenny or others, please follow. But um, our anticipation as we indicated here is to, is to enroll in the, in the geographies that are mentioned here. We do not preset limitations on the, on the institutions that are participating in terms of the number of patients that enroll. As Judy has mentioned, um, we are eager to, to bring this study along so that we can advance our conversations around um, bringing this product forward more broadly. Um, so uh, we are engaging uh, approximately um, 30 sites across these geographies and potentially more, um, but not with any restrictions on the number of patients per institution. Thanks, Jen. I can answer this question. Will all of us be at the FSHD IRC and patient meeting in June? There will be a strong group of us from Fulcrum and we hope to see you there. Um, and another question was when was the next FSHD meeting? And I believe that that is the IRC and patient connect meeting, which you can follow up with the society on, on how to get connected with us there. Um, the next question is uh, about registries. Um, folks are wondering if speed is our goal to getting the study started, what steps are we taking to reach out actively to those folks with FSHD to recruit? Is there a use of registries? And if so, which ones are we, uh, are we using? Olga, you want to grab that one? I think that one of the things that we're definitely doing is we're working very closely with the FSHD Society um, in order to get the word out um, about uh, this trial, about where to find information, about um, the fact that folks um, will soon be able to go to clinicaltrials.gov and learn even more. Um, I think that participation in a registry is a way to be connected to the community. It is a way to be connected to the medical centers that may potentially participate in, in our trial or other trials. And it is a way to contribute while we're all waiting um, for uh, this program, um, other programs, and provide information about uh, natural history, which is vital to um, our understanding of how to proceed with drug development. Thanks, Olga. There's some questions from folks. We have people all over the world here. I've been watching um, from the different places that, that folks are. And there's a question around EMA. Do we anticipate that the EMA will be evaluating um, and, and considering Los Mapamod around the same time as FDA or do we anticipate a, a difference in timing? So we, we have not, as Judy mentioned earlier, um, communicated any specificity around our regulatory pathway. Um, but as you see here, we are certainly engaging in regions which the EMEA has uh, guidance over. So we, of course, intend to engage them appropriately along the way. Thanks, Jen. So there's another question around participating in multiple trials and specifically the examples were move and mover um, and then the question was, will participating in a phase three of Los Mapamod affect chances of being in other trials? So I don't know if somebody wants to address both of those, previous participation in other studies and future participation in trials. Yeah, I can address that one. So uh, previous participation in any natural history studies such as Resolve or the MOVE study or other studies that may be ongoing in, in other parts of the country or in Europe, um, will not uh, 
exclude someone from participating in this study. But during the study itself, you will not be allowed to be actively enrolled in a natural history study. Um, and I think the second part of that question was, will being on most Mapamod um, as part of the phase three then prohibit you from being in another study? So I will say that you won't be um, able to be a part of two interventional studies, meaning two studies that have uh, an interventional drug that are being evaluated. Um, if for any reason you are in the phase three trial and stop the medication, um, typically most companies um, have a policy of uh, an adequate washout period. So it would be a couple months after your last dose of the drug, and then you would still be likely able to um, enroll in a different study if that were the case, but it may be on a case-by-case -case basis. Thanks, Jenny. There's a question just for a clarifying question. Our criteria says candidates with FSHD one and two. Do we mean and, or did we mean or? Can patients with both one and two participate or is it an or? I can take that one as well. And I know that there's, it, it's hard to word this exactly right, but um, for this phase three study, it will include patients with FSHD one, and then a subgroup or a smaller group of patients with FSHD2. We will not be enrolling those that have both FSHD1 and type 2 at this point, just based on what we know about los um, and what we hope to be able to learn in the future. Thanks, Jenny. And there's also a question around how does the phase three trial impact those patients that are in the open label extension um, or have participated in the phase two? Is there any impact or merging of the two studies? So at this point, um, you know, what our, what our goal is, is to A, enroll this trial and to, as, as we've elucidated, really make the open label trial available uh, to participants. Uh, similarly, as we've done in Redux 4. So currently, we have not provided any additional information. If you were in Redux 4 and you're doing your open label extension now, you continue in that. Um, if you're going to enroll in REACH, you will also have an open label extension trial. So at this point, that's, that's the guidance we're given, and there will be uh, open label access to, participation, uh, to participants in both of those trials. Thanks, Judy. There's a question about uh, travel reimbursement. Do we have plans to, to provide travel reimbursement during the clinical trial? Yes, so I can take that question. Similar to what was done in Redux 4, um, we will be using a travel vendor to ensure that travel to and from the, the clinical site um, is covered and will be reimbursed. Thanks, Jenny. We have one more question um, around the uh, support of patients. So um, are there going to be any programs to help participants in the study remain, remain on medication once it is commercially available? I think Olga, probably that's a question for you, but you know, I know that is something that we're carefully thinking through. It's very, very early days still being in development, but perhaps you some, have some better insight. Um, I think what we can say is that um, we are committed that patients who participate in our trials will remain on drug um, until there's commercialization and access for them. And, and we know that um, the day that a drug is approved does not mean on this day that everybody has access. And we as a company are committed to fight for that access. But as we fight for that access with you, we will make sure that, that those who are in open label extensions are continued on drug. Thanks, Olga. Go ahead, Jen. No, I was just gonna jump in and say this is a tremendous conversation and clearly there's um, great excitement on all parties. Um, we are over time and I wanna be sensitive to the fact that folks have dialed in from all over the world. Um, and clearly there's, um, there's, there's great gratitude on our part for the interest in the program. Um, but I did want to leave time for some closing comments from the society and just to echo where Judy started and Anthony and others have continued, which is to say this program is about doing things that are 
helpful for the community. And we hope to demonstrate that that will be the case. And we appreciate your commitment to engaging with us. And we, we, we cherish the opportunity to have this kind of conversation. Um, I think I'll wrap there unless anyone has anything else from the fulcrum side. Judy, others to comment before we close and over hand it back to June? No, okay. June then, would you like to offer some closing remarks and our thank you to you as well for arranging this conversation today. Yes, uh, well, thank you so much. Big round of applause everybody for the Fulcrum team. Um, we've worked with Fulcrum for many years and you are really a, an exemplar of how biopharmaceutical companies um, should be. I mean, in terms of your openness and your um, engagement with the patient community. And um, you know, you haven't really tooted your own horn here, so I will, but you have really pushed forward the science of um, outcome instruments. You have taken the risk upon yourselves to develop outcome instruments that can show efficacy in FSHD trials. And that was a huge, um, huge undertaking. And we really applaud you for that. So thank you. Um, thank you to our audience today. We had so many other questions. I'm going to save the, the Q&A transcript, if I can, we'll try to answer some of those offline um, on, on our website and blog post and so forth. So thank you all so much for your questions. And um, we will see more of you at the appropriate time. <laughs> thank you, June. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, thank June. You. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Hey, well.